Welcome to our final lecture for Math 1324. Today we're going to look at how to use probability in something um, called a decision matrix. And it's actually quite an interesting and logical tool to help with um, sometimes difficult decisions if um, the answers are pretty close together. You're not exactly sure what's going to happen. <clears throat> decision making. John F. Kennedy once remarked that he had assumed that, as president, it would be difficult to choose between distinct opposite alternatives when a decision needed to be made. Actually, he found that such decisions were easy to make. The hard decisions came when he was faced with choices that were not as clear cut. Most decisions fall into this last category, decisions that must be made under conditions of uncertainty. In section 9.1, we saw how to use expected values to help make a decision. Those ideas are extended in this section where we consider decision making in the face of uncertainty. So let's look at an example. So this is a pretty packed example. So I'm going to read it first and then we'll talk about it. Freezing temperatures are endangering the orange crop in central California. A farmer can protect his crop by burning smudge pots. The heat from the pots keeps the oranges from freezing. However, burning the pots is expensive, costing $20,000. The farmer knows that if he burns smudge pots, he will be able to sell his crop for a net profit after the costs of the pots are deducted of $50,000, provided that the freeze does develop and wipes out other orange crops in California. If he does nothing, he will either lose the 10000 he has already invested in the crop if it does freeze, or he will make a profit of $46,000 if it does not freeze. If it does not freeze, there will be a large supply of oranges, and thus his profit will be lower than if there were a small supply. What should the farmer do? Okay. So what we're going to do is look at something called a decision matrix. And here is what we, we build a matrix that compares the states of nature. And these are the possible alternatives over which um, the decision maker has no control. So in this problem, what are the states of nature that the farmer has no control over? Well, he has no control over whether it freezes or not, all right? He doesn't know, I mean, he, he may know a prediction for the weather, like it's going to be a bad winter, but he doesn't know for sure what's going to happen. And so um, the states of nature are the things that you have no control over. In this case, it would be just um, it does freeze or it doesn't freeze. Okay. We also compare it with the things that he can control. And these are the strategies, his actions or strategies. Now, what does this problem tell us the strategies are. What is his decision that he needs to make? He needs to decide whether he's going to burn the smudge pots um, or not. Okay. And so in both of these, it's kind of an either or. It's either going to freeze or it's not. He's either going to use smudge pots or he's not. Okay. The consequences of each action under each state of nature called payoffs are summarized in a payoff matrix as follows, where the payoff in this case are the profits for each of the combination of events. Okay, so this is our payoff matrix and you can see that we put the states of nature across the top. These are our columns. And remember, we consider whether it's going to freeze or no freeze. And then all the rows are the strategies of the decision maker. In this case, it was to use smudge pots or do not use smudge pots. So we have a matrix with four entries. And now what we have to do is go back and look at the data given in the problem so that we can fill in our matrix. So let's look at the first one. If he burns smudge pots, that's this first row, he will be able to sell his crop for a net profit after the cost of the pots are deducted of $50,000 provided the freeze does develop. So if he burns pots and it does freeze, burns pots and it does freeze, then he's going to earn a profit of $50,000. Okay, so we filled in our first member. 
take a pause now and see if hit pause and see if you can look at these other numbers and figure out how to fill in those other three places. All right, continuing on. If he does nothing, so this is not using the pots, this will be the bottom row, he will either lose 10,000, he has already invested if it does freeze. Lose 10,000 if it freezes. So here's freeze, and losing 10,000 means that his profit would be negative 10,000. If he does nothing, he will either lose the 10,000 he has already invested if it does freeze or make a profit of 46,000 if it does not freeze. So that's over here. He does nothing and it doesn't freeze. He gets 46,000. Okay. Why is that? If it doesn't freeze, there'll be a large supply of oranges and thus his profit will be lower um, because the, the costs, you know, the, the price that the market pays to oranges is less because there's lots of them. Now, this last one's a little bit confusing, and students just want to plop this 20000 in there. But that 20000 is not the profit. That's telling how much it costs, how much it costs to build, um, to use the pots. So what if he uses the pots and it doesn't freeze? All right. <clears throat> Remember that if he does nothing and it doesn't freeze, then he earns 46,000. Okay, so this is the general pot. You know, if there's no freeze, then we know that the, the supply is gonna be large and so his profits are gonna be smaller. But what if he does use the smudge pots? If he didn't use the pots, he would make 46,000, but if he does use the pots, what does that cost him? It costs him that $20,000. So in this last this last area where he does he uses the pots and it doesn't freeze, we have to do a calculation here, which is forty six thousand minus the cost of the twenty thousand dollars for using the pots, and so we get the twenty six thousand dollars. Okay, so most of the answers were given to us just in the problem. The last answer um, for using smudge pots and it doesn't freeze, we had to kind of think through and use, again, the data in the problem, but we had to do a calculation, 46,000 minus the cost of the pots, okay? Start with your table, states of nature across the top, strategies along the side, and then look at your blanks and try to figure out from the data from the problem that matches the categories, um, using pots and when it freezes, using pots it doesn't freeze, doing nothing freeze, doing nothing no freeze. All right. So let's look at what happens now. Once the farmer makes the payoff matrix, what then? What should we do? Okay. Well, there's no really right or wrong answer here. It's really about making choices. And obviously that's what this whole section's about. So for example, the farmer might be an optimist. Some might even call him a gambler. In this case, he might assume that the best will happen and go for the biggest number of the matrix, $50,000. For that profit, he must adopt the strategy of using smudge pots. So if our decision maker is an optimist, what we do is we look at all of the numbers in the matrix, the payoff matrix, and simply pick the best one, the highest one in this case, because it's profit, okay? So if our farmer is an optimist, we're gonna assume that he's gonna use smudge pots and think it's gonna freeze to his benefit. Well, what if he's an, a pessimist, okay? Now, if on the other hand, if the farmer's a pessimist, he would want to minimize the worst thing that could happen. So what we need to do if, we, if we're looking at a pessimistic decision maker, we look at each row and pick the worst number in the row. So for example, if he uses smudge pots and there is no freeze, then he's only he's going to make twenty six thousand dollars. If he doesn't use the pots and it freezes, he's going to lose ten thousand dollars. So what we do then is we compare the two worst case in this example, the worst case for row one, the worst case for row two, and then pick the better number. Okay. So since 26,000 is a lot better than negative 10,000, 
the pessimistic farmer is going to pick also to use smudge pots. In this case, the optimist and the pessimist actually pick the same strategy. Okay, so again, the optimistic decision maker just looks at the whole matrix and picks the best number. The pessimistic decision maker looks at each row and looks finds the worst number in each row and then picks the best of the worst. Okay, the best of the worst. So this is really important for figuring out how to um, answer problems in, on your homework, etc., because you might be given an optimistic decision maker or a pessimistic decision maker and have to decide um, what they will do. Let's look at another way of how we can use expected value. Suppose the farmer decides that he is neither an optimist nor a pessimist, but would like further information before choosing a strategy. For example, he might call the weather forecaster and ask for the probability of a freeze this winter or this month, whatever. Suppose the forecaster says that this probability is only 0.2 what should the farmer do? He should recall the discussion of expected value and work out the expected profit for each of his two possible strategies. So if there's a probability of 0.2 for a freeze, that's here, what's the probability of no freeze? Well, these are complementary ideas, right? Um, so the complement of uh, an outcome is its opposite, right? So if the probability of it freezing is 0.2, the probability of not freezing is 0.8. So in order to calculate the expected value, remember we use the probability times the random variable plus the probability times the random variable. And so we would get these, uh, the following expected values. So 50,000 times the probability over freeze 0.2 plus 26,000 times the probability it won't freeze 0.8 gives me 30,800. If no smudge pots are used, we again use the 0.2 and 0.8 um, with our values in the matrix and we get 34,800. And so in this case, based upon the probability that it's, um, that it's only a 0.2 probability of a freeze, it actually works out in his better interest to, um, from the expected value to decide not to use the smudge pots. Okay, so let's look at another example. An owner of several greeting card companies guard stores must decide in July about the type of displays to emphasize for sweetest day in October. He has three possible choices, emphasize chocolates, emphasize collectible gifts, or emphasize gifts that can be engraved. His success is dependent on the state of the economy in October. If the economy is strong, he will do well with the collectible gifts. While in a weak economy, the chocolates do very well. In a mixed economy, the gifts that can be engraved will do well. He first prepares a payoff matrix for all three possibility where the numbers in the matrix represent his profits in thousands of dollars. And so again, the states of nature are the things he cannot control. He cannot control the economy, whether it's strong or weak. And then his strategies are what he's going to do. Is he going to emphasize chocolates, emphasize collectibles, or emphasize engraved gifts? Now, in this problem, this table was already given to us. The payoff matrix was given to us. So if he emphasizes chocolates, for example, and it's a weak economy, he's going to make a profit of $85,000. Remember, these are in thousands of dollars. So based upon this matrix, what would an optimist do? Do you remember what an optimist does? How do they use the matrix? They look at every single number and then they pick the largest one. So an optimist would emphasize collectibles because $110,000 in profit is the biggest number in the whole chart. Now, what would a pessimist do? A pessimist looks at the worst case in every row. So for chocolates, the worst case is that if there's a mixed economy, he's only going to make $30,000. If he emphasizes collectibles in a weak or mixed economy, he's going to make $45,000. If he emphasizes engraved in a weak economy, he's only going to make $60,000. So now based upon these three different numbers, 30, 45, or 60, 
the pessimist picks the best of the worst, which is simply the $60,000. So an optimist would emphasize the collectibles and hope for a strong economy. The pessimist would emphasize the engrave, kind of to hedge his bets is what we say. He picks the best of the worst. Suppose the owner reads in a magazine that leading experts believe that there is a 50% chance of a weak economy in October, a 20% chance of a mixed economy, and a 30% chance of a strong economy. How might he use this information? So now you have to calculate the expected value of each of the three strategies, chocolates, collectibles, or engravings. Okay, 50% um, 0.5 times these numbers for the weak economy, 0.2 times these numbers of a mixed economy plus 0.3 um, times these numbers for a strong economy. And here are the different um, expected values we get. And again, here we're going to pick the largest one that, of these. And so the best strategy is to display, sorry about that. The best strategy is display gifts that can be engraved. The expected profit is $74.5 or $74,500. That's the end of this course. That's the end of the lecture. Um, if you have any questions, please do reach out.